Hello and welcome to Thin Blue Line Radio's Through the Decades uh, episode where we focus on matters pre-1970. I'm JP. And I'm Dave. And today's case, we're going to look at the Shepherd's Bush murders, also known as the Massacre of Braybrook Street, which involved the murders of uh, temporary Detective Constable David Wombwell, Detective Sergeant Christopher Head, and Police Constable Geoffrey Fox. So on the 12th of August in 1966, uh, the Metropolitan Police crew, uh, who were travelling in an unmarked Triumph 2000 Q car, uh, and they was under the call sign of Foxtrot 11. Uh, they was patrolling East Acton, although the incident was always reported by the media as occurring in Shepherd's Bush in West London. Now, uh, the Sergeant uh, Chris Head, uh, he was 30 years of age and temperate Detective Constable uh, David Bertram Wombwell, uh, he was age 25. They were both members of the CID department, the Criminal Investigation Department, and they were based at Shepherd Bush, uh, f- uh, Shepherd's Bush Police Station in F Division, uh, which obviously covered the Metropolitan Borough of Hammersmith. And the driver uh, was PC Geoffrey Fox. Uh, he was 41 and he was a class one advanced driver and a beat constable who had served for many years in F Division and frequently acted as a Q car driver due to his vast local knowledge. Uh, and all three of them were in plain clothes. Uh, and as it says, they was, they was just patrolling in East Acton. So you can imagine that Geoffrey Fox was obviously the fountain of all knowledge for that earlier. He will have known that area like the back of his hand. Yeah, at about 3.15pm, uh, they turned on to Braybrook Street, which from everything I can find has been described as a lovely um, kind of suburb street. Um, it's got a row of houses one side with a nice little field opposite with children's play area. Um, not the kind of area where you would typically expect something like this to have occurred. But they were going down Braybrook Street in the Old Oak Council Estate, which borders the Wormwood Scrubs and the Wormwood Scrubs Prison. They've spotted a battered blue standard Vanguard estate van that was parked at the roadside with three men sitting inside. Obviously, this is a good few years ago where escapees from prison were, were more regular. So, since escapes were sometimes attempted from the prison uh, with the assistance of getaway vehicles, uh, the officers have decided to question the occupants. Um, it, it's suggested that PC Fox has also recognised the van's driver as a local known criminal. The vehicles had no tax, uh, which back then was a legal requirement. Considering that nowadays you don't have to display it, to thinking back then where he's noticed that that little sheet of paper's not displayed, little did he know stopping him thinking to himself, oh, we'll have a chat with these, not realising that that would be the end end of his watch. Especially with it being a, lo- a known local criminal. Because, I mean, I know from experience now, if you see someone that you know, your guard isn't always as high as it could be because you've got previous incidents with them. So it might have been a case of, oh, I've seen, I've dealt with this, people all, this person all the time. He's, he's going to be sound. He's just, I'll make sure that he's uh, doing what he should be doing and he's not transporting a few people from the local prison where they don't need to be. As we say, Jeffrey Fox, he's gonna he's gonna know the area like about the back of his hand. He's gonna know all the people that they need to speak to, and you know, to to be able to stop, search, uh, and do whatever. Obviously, what we need to bear in mind as well: this is 1966, so this is pre-pace. So way back then, policing was a completely different world. The kit and the equipment was completely different to what officers have nowadays. Uh, would have been right in saying that in 66 it would have been uh, a truncheon it would have been the the truncheon they'd have had uh, but obviously these are in so say that's that's for standard patrols as well this yeah. this was CID when CID's driver yeah so whether they had anything on them other than the I think they were in uniform weren't they because on the pictures of them no, there was a mark. Was it plain clothes? Yeah, plain, plain clothes. Plain clothes? Or mark car plain clothes. It's the shirt and tie, isn't it? I'm used to the shirt and tie being the uniform. But yeah, because the, back then the tunics, wasn't it? Because the, 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 yeah, back it then was. it would have been the tunics. We, we can presume that obviously they've seen this vehicle uh, and thought, oh, that's worth having a chat. And then obviously Jeffrey Fox has noticed the driver known as Whitney. So he's obviously turned around and gone, we need to speak to these lads because, uh, you, like you said, I've had dealings with these lads before. Let's get out and let's have a chat with them. So what they're doing, what they're up to, what they're doing in the area. Especially so close to the prison. If they, mm-hmm. if back then there was quite a few 
escapes and attempt escapes from little banged up vans driving away. DS Head and DC Wumwell have then exited the vehicle. Jeffrey Fox has stayed in the driver's the driver's side vehicle, uh, just parked in front of the van. Head and Wumwell have exited the car and walked over to the van, where they've started questioning Whitney about the lack of the tax, di tax disc. Obviously, that's what they've noticed. He then replied that he'd not got his MOT test certificate, and that was required before the tax disc could be issued. So Chris Head has then asked Whitney for his driving license and his vehicle insurance certificate. Noticing that the latter had expired at midday that day, he told Dave Wombwell um, to go round and obtain Whitney's details. Uh, he's then walked round to the other side of the van, but Whitney's protested that he'd been caught for the same offence only a couple of weeks before uh, and pled to be given a break. However, this is where matters took a horrific turn. Now, bear in mind, going back to what we said before, it's a residential street in a suburb. There's children playing fields on the right. There's a row of houses on the left. We know from the, you know, the media little clips that we've got back then that there was people on the field. There was people on in the gardens. There was, you know, as they say, Mrs. Miggins washing her front doorstep. There was people in this street. It was just a bog standard residential street. And there was people out. This is as Dave has approached the front seat passenger, who we now know is Harry Roberts, who has produced a Luger pistol, and he's obviously made some form of comment, something along the lines of F off, uh, we believe, and he's pulled a trigger, and he shot Dave Wombwell in the face at point-blank range, entering his left eye, killing him instantly, and he's fell back onto the road. And it's at that point that uh, DS Head has run back towards his car, um, but Roberts has got out and given chase. And after missing with the first shot, he's managed to shoot him. Then a backseat passenger, Duddy, has also got out, grabbed a .38 Webley service revolver from the bag next to him, ran over to the police car and shot PC Fox three times through the window as he's tried to reverse at speed uh, towards him and Roberts. Several shots were also fired at the car and he, ha as he died, his foot has jerked down the accelerator causing the car to lurch forward, unfortunately over the, um, the body of DS Head, who was already dying of his wounds. Uh, and as we said before, this is a residential street in London, in the UK, where you can imagine I live in quite, I live in the suburbs. It's quite, it can be a busy street. Everyone knows everyone. So you can imagine for well, you, you, several shots, several loud bangs to be coming. You can imagine how many people have thought, what's going on outside? So you've got people on the fields looking over thinking, what's going on over there? You know, the residents coming out thinking, what's all this noise? What is going on? Yeah, especially because I think I believe it was about quarter past three in the afternoon. So it's not even like it was late at night or early in the morning. It, it's, I mean, I, I don't know what schools were like back then, but that's cool kick out time around here. Yeah. So if it was happening here, the amount of people who'd be walking home or just coming out of school or driving on the school run is, is unreal. There'd be, there'd be everyone out. Broad daylight, loads of people present, loads of witnesses and multiple shots into three officers. Broad daylight. At the aftermath of this is obviously you can imagine the chaotic scene that's going on at the minute because you've you've got these officers, two of them technically lay in the street. You've got one who's 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 been killed sat in the driver's side car. The the car windshield was shattered with the hole in where the bullets have entered. What the vehicles on top of 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 Chris' head, um, and this is where Duddy and Roberts have thought this is this is the time where we need to. Uh, gets get out of here and that's where they've run back to the van and Whitney's reversed rapidly down a side street and pulled out onto Wolfston Street before um, speeding away. Now thankfully because of the witnesses uh, and there were several witnesses obviously they couldn't they couldn't give a, a, a great explanation of because in that situation you're thinking they're not going to be paying attention to what's going on. Back then a police officer stopping and speaking to someone you know Nowadays, it, it garners a lot of interest. 
However, back then, these are plain clothes, so is it, it's just a couple of lads having a chat in the street. Just, and could just be a, a couple of cars in the street and nothing particularly special until all the, uh, the uh, sounds of gunfire. Luckily, obviously, that has uh, instigated everyone's attention to be drawn to Braybrook Street and the, uh, you know, the instant that is unfolding in front of him. And luckily, several passers-by and obviously people who are watching this van reverse down the street, they can see people lying in the road. Little did they know the police officers. Obviously, they've managed to write down the registration of the plate that the three offenders were in, the Vanguard, the standard Vanguard estate van, uh, which was Packer Golf, Papert Golf Tango 726, which has been pivotal in the officer's investigation immediately after to try and identify the van and detain the offenders. Yeah, because it was it was Whitney's van, so it's directed them straight towards Mr. Whitney, who I believe initially claimed he'd sold it uh, earlier in the day for the ripe sum of £15 to an unknown man, but later confessed that, um, yeah, it was his car. Thankfully, managing to name his accomplices at the time. So just the very fact that someone managed to get that VRM, get that registration and give it to the police has completely cracked the entire case and who the suspects were and uh, led on to a much bigger investigation and manhunt for the other two people. And it's obviously the the, the next day they've, you know, they've, they've located the lockup garage rented by Whitney under the railway bridge in Vauxhall. And that's where there's some spent uh, 38 cartridges and equipment that could be used for stealing cars. Uh, as you say, he confessed on the 14th of August, admitting what had happened and naming everyone involved. And then obviously we've got that, you know, Duddy's then fled to his native Glasgow, but he was arrested on the 17th of August, using information obtained from his brother. So his own brother has obviously seen the fallout of what's going on down in London and possibly, uh, you know, we, speculation, you know, and obviously we don't deal in speculation, but you can only imagine that whether his brother has heard and realised the gravity, the gravity, of the yeah, and no. he's turned around and gone. Oh, oh, you need to be responsible for your own actions here. Now, it wasn't as easy as that to get hold of Roberts. After meeting his common law wife for money, he's moved through uh, Epping Forest. Uh, he's then used a tented camp to hide out in Thorleywood near Bishop Stafford in Hertfordshire uh, to avoid the huge manhunt until the cold weather set in. Uh, and he used his military training because uh, he had served as a soldier during the Malayan emergency and he's, he's utilised that experience to avoid police capture for three months. So that led to the police um, issuing rewards, which I believe was £1,000 initially, which today it would be about £19,000, well, in 2020 it would have been about £19,000, um, offered for information leading to his arrest. Uh, that led to him finally being arrested on the 15th of November while sleeping in a disused airfield hangar on Blount's farm in Sawbridgeworth near Bishop Stafford. Uh, he was familiar with the area as he had often visited there as a child with his mum. So on the 14th of November, the trial of Whitney and Duddy began at the Old Bailey. It was almost immediately adjourned after Robert's arrest uh, so that they could deal with all three of them together. Now Robert did plead guilty to the murders of Chris Head and Dave Wormwell but he didn't to Geoffrey Fox. Now, while the other two defendants denied all the charges, only Whitney testified in his own defence saying that he, he and Duddy were terrified of Roberts because Roberts was what we would class as a prolific offender. And an ex-military man, all the training. Yeah. Um, it was believed he was the one with the access to the firearms and all that. You can understand them being scared of him. Yeah. So, obviously, the, the numerous dealings with Roberts, uh, the police have had. There's nothing to suggest that he knew the officers that he dealt with on that particular day, who he, uh, the couple of them who he subsequently went on to murder. However, on the 12th of December 1966, after a trial lasting six days, the three men were convicted of murder uh, and possession of firearms and sentenced to life imprisonment. And it only saw the jury 30 minutes. 30 minutes to reach that verdict, so there must have been outstanding evidence against them. So, completely without doubt. The judge who presided over it, Mr Justice Glyn Jones, he recommended that they serve at least 30 years before being come, becoming eligible for parole. And he commented that the murders were the most heinous crime to have been committed in this country for a generation or more. Of which when you think police officers 
dying in the line of duty, being killed in the line of duty, as we know through the roll calls and through this, you know, the, the podcast. There is many, but what's more concerning for this one is there was intent the a firearm shot into someone's face and then chased and shot and yeah because um, as, as much as there is many especially when you look at recent times there's not that many where it starts off as a simple traffic stop and you end up with three officers being shot particularly when one of them has been in the car so they've shot him straight away but then the other one's been running away so they've had ample opportunity then to just escape. Mm -hmm. But instead, they've decided to get out of the car and go after the other two, one of which was just sat in the car and then actively trying to escape. But they've not left at that. They've decided that they had to kill all three of them. Nowadays, when a police officer's killed in the line of duty, there is always an outpouring of grief from the community, which is sometimes local community too nationally there's an outpouring of grief but the re the reaction as you've you, we can see through the clips on the the internet we can see old uh, clips from news clips and media and stuff like that that the murders caused outrage in the uk uh, and there were there were actually calls as a result of this case the reintroduction of the recently abolished death penalty and for a, a, an increase in the number of police officers trained to use firearms um, because as everybody knows, if you're downloading outside of the UK, uh, British police officers are normally unarmed. We have specially trained firearms officers and unit departments that are centralised where they deploy to matters or they are sent to areas to patrol um, rather than, you know, the uh, routinely arming of officers. We have incapacitant spray, baton, tank taser. Huffs, taser. So we are better than they will have been. Yeah. They're being CID. I mean, even now, CID don't have anything. They are just walk around in suits. I yeah. don't even have a driver. They have to drive themselves. Yeah. So given that circumstance, I mean, CID no longer routinely stop cars. But if they were in the position that these officers found themselves back in 1966, in terms of their equipment, they wouldn't be much better off. And as a result of this specific incident, uh, the Metropolitan Police Firearms Wing was established for the funeral that obviously took place uh, 600 metropolitan police officers lined the route uh, for the three victims for the funeral procession through shepherd's brush and a memorial service in westminster abbey was attended by then harold wilson who was the prime minister and the leader of the opposition edward heath and obviously many many other dignitaries uh, as well as the thousands of police officers from all over the country as we say it's not just Irrelevant of the distance and irrelevant of the location and, and what's between us. You know, we're all brothers and sisters in blue. Uh, and we see it so many times where forces do send contingency of officers and officers do request permission from their forces to say, can I go down and pay tribute? And Yeah. But more so, more than, you know, 1,000 members of the public stood in mourning outside the Abbey. And the holiday camp owner, Billy Butlin, uh, he donated £250,000 to a new police dependence trust uh, and it, it soon raised more than a million pounds. Which, I mean, a million pounds is a lot of money now, but when you go back to 1966, I mean, as you saw before, what was it? £15, One, 20 grand, something like that. Yeah. £1,000 was equivalent to £19,000. Exactly. 